Good day students, welcome to mathgoodserve.com. In this clip, we're going to be going over problems 1 to 24 of the Algebra 1 Common Core Regents exam for August 2015. This is a high-speed review um, clip. If you want a much more detailed explanation of all the problems, you can simply click on the link to get um, a step-by-step -step explanation of each part. And if you want to get access to the transcripts of this video, you can also click on the link um, provided here. For problem number one, we have a function and there is an increment in the value of b of the function. So when you add or subtract a constant to a function, that results in a vertical shift. Okay, so if you increase by 4, that results in a shift vertically 4 units up since 4 is positive. So your answer is going to be number 2. For problem number 2, you just need to remember how to convert word problems into um, linear equations using the slope and the y-intercepts. Normally, the starting amount is your y-intercept and the amount at which it grows at an interval, in this case every week, is going to be your slope. All right, so we have two scenarios here, um, Rowan and Jonah. So you, the first task is to convert the situation into a slope-intercept form equation for Rowan and Jonah. And then all you're doing is basically comparing the slopes and the y-intercept. So whichever one has a bigger positive slope, that's steeper than the other one with a smaller positive slope. And whichever has a bigger um, y-intercept that's above the other um, line with the smaller y-intercept. So by complete comparing the slopes and the y-intercepts, you can see that Jonah's um, situation is much more steeper than that of Rowan because it has a bigger slope. And concerning option number two, even though Rowan lies above Jonah's line at the beginning because the slope is smaller, Jonah's line will eventually catch up and exceed Rowan's line. So that's why Rowan's graph is not always above that of Jonah because the slope for Rowan is smaller than that of Jonah. For problem number three, you have to remember the formula for total cost. The total cost formula is the unit price multiplied by quantity. So in this situation, we have adults and student um, tickets. So we apply this formula twice to calculate the total cost for adult tickets and um, student tickets. And then from the problem, you can extract what the information are, the unit price and the quantity for adult and students transform that into algebraic expressions, and then you just simply add them up to get your final answer, which is option number four. For problem four, we are given a graph and we are asked to create um, a polynomial function that represents it. So in this case, you just have to remember that um, your roots are what x is equal to. If you want to convert your roots into factors, you have to set each and every one of them equal to zero before you multiply. You don't just take them the way they are. You don't say x minus four times x minus two times x plus one. That's incorrect. You're gonna take the opposite of the roots before you can put them in factored form, okay? And then um, if you notice here, the um, factored state or the polynomial format is not completely expanded. All right, so we just left out the x plus 2 piece. And then the last two, you just distribute or use FOIL uh, to simplify that. And you end up with option number one as your correct answer. For problem five, it's another total cost problem. Remember, total cost is the unit price multiplied by quantity. An interesting thing about this scenario is it's an inequality is talking about maximum. So anytime you see the word maximum, you, you remember you can have that value or anything less. It's kind of like a ceiling, okay? So we don't have an equation here. We have to set up an 
inequality. So we basically look at gum and bottles and use the same total cost formula we talked about earlier to create uh, an expression for gum and um, bottles. And then you basically add both of them together and it has to be the cost of gum and bottle has to be less than or equal to the ceiling amount of $22. So since $22 is the maximum, the, com the combined cost of gum and bottle has to be less than or equal to that amount. So don't forget, maximum means less than or greater, I mean less than or equal to. And if you have minimum, um, it, it basically includes involves greater than for minimum, okay? For problem number six, we are solving systems of linear inequalities by graphing. So for this one, you simply want to extract the slope and the y-intercept. In this problem, the slope is not applicable since all four options have lines of exactly the same slope. So all you're looking at here is the y-intercepts. Um, oh, those are the same two. You're just looking at the um, shading, the direction of the shade. So you want to remember that um, whenever you have less than, you shade below the line. And whenever you have greater than, you shade above the line. Making use of arrows can help you determine um, the correct shaded region for the result. Okay? So for the first line, you have less than. So that means the arrow is going to be pointing downwards for the line x plus 3 which is a line with positive slope starting from three. And then the second line is greater than, so you identify the line um, with the negative slope, the descending line, and you shade upwards. So any region where both arrows are pointing to exactly the same quadrant, that is the correct solution region. If you look at option three, this arrow is pointing down, this arrow is pointing up, and this is the shaded region for both uh, regions. So the correct answer is option number three. For problem number four, I mean number seven, this is a population growth um, problem. This is pretty straightforward. You just really have to remember you, the formula for growth and decay. For population growth, you have A, the initial amount times one plus. Okay, the growth rate quantity raised to the t power. Now, if you have a decay situation, this would be, be a minus. Another thing to remember is that the percentage has to be expressed in decimal form. You convert percents to decimal by moving the decimal po point forward twice. And that gives you the decimal um, representation of the percentage value. And then you input that into your formula for growth, discrete growth. And that will give you option number three. For problem number um, eight, this is another cost problem. So we're looking at charges here. For problem eight, we have a base charge. So anytime you have the base charge, you, you're going to be adding that into the other component, which is the unit price times quantity, since the base charge is independent of the quantity um, being purchased or sold. So for this one, we have 62 as a base charge, and you're going to use the unit price times quantity to generate the second piece of your function. The unit price is per, okay? So $30 per gigabyte is the unit price. In this scenario, we're looking at the number of gigabytes that exceeds two gigabytes. So exceed basically means more um, involves a subtraction operation. So if you have 10 gigabytes, for example, and you want to look at the number of gigabytes that exceeds two, you just compute 10 minus two. So it's like a difference relationship here as illustrated here. So if it's five gigabytes, five minus two, uh, five exceeds two by three, six exceeds two by four. So if you have G gigabytes, G gigabytes exceeds two, by G minus two. So that's your quantity of gigabytes used. So you have your base price of 62 plus the unit price 30 times the quantity, which is G minus two. So that basically outlined it, outlines the charges. And the answer is option number four.
For problem nine, um, you're given multiple expressions and you're, you're expected to determine the one that's equivalent to this provided expression right here. So this for this one is just assessing your ability to distribute correctly. So remember when you're distributing, you want to multiply the number on the outside by every single term on the inside. Okay, so if you carry out the distribution, you find out that only one, two, and four, when expanded completely results in four x squared minus four x minus 120. All right, problem number 10 is uh, solving of uh, simultaneous equations. Um, and then when you're solving simultaneous equations, you have two sets of equations with two unknowns that you're trying to find. Um, I use the method of, of elimination here. I eliminated the variable that I wasn't asked to find. So since I'm looking for um, the number of large candles sold, I proceeded to eliminate the number of small candles. So I, whatever answer I get from that elimination pr procedure will be my final answer. So whenever you're solving by um, elimination or substitution, you want to be strategic and try to get the desired answer first. In this setup, we have two equations. The first is the cost equation using unit price times quantity formula that we talked about earlier. And then we have to declare our variables first, of course, um, S for number of large candles, L for number of, I mean, S for small candles and L for large candles. And then you have your cost for small candles and large candles and the total cost. And then quantity is basically how many candles does the store sell in total, and that's 20. So I eliminated the S by multiplying the second equation by the opposite of the coefficient of S in the cost equation. What happens by carrying out that procedure is that when you combine the two equations, the S's get eliminated since your coefficients are opposites of each other. And then you get L by itself and you are done. Option number two is the final answer. For problem 11, you have to remember the different representations of a function. For tabular representation, they cannot be repetitions in the X uh, or, or input values. For ordered pairs, exactly the same as tabular. For option two, we have ordered pairs. They cannot be any repetition in the X's. For option three, graphical, um, it must pass the vertical line test. In this case, it fails the vertical line test because this vertical line intersects at two points. Okay, for uh, um, option four, if you're given an algebraic equation, make sure that your output variable has an odd power. If it has an even power, then it is not a function. Okay, so given these four representations, the only um, ones that pass are 2 and 4 because 2 has no repetitions on the x and 4 has an output variable of an odd power, okay? Number 1 has repetition on the x's and 3 fills the vertical line test. Problem number 12 is assessing your ability to evaluate functions and make accurate use of the order of operations. So given this function, you're asked to find f of 1 half all you simply do is plug in one half into the x's and accurately follow your order of operations to arrive at the solution of negative one. Problem 13 is assessing your ability to solve quadratic equations. You can solve them using factory method. You can solve it by graphing, by completing the square or the quadratic formula. So the answers here are rational zeros, then that tells you you can solve this by factoring. So you can use the X game or you can use the box method or guess and check to fax, factor this expression. And then you use the zero product property to set the factors equal to zero and you get your solutions to a negative one, option number four. Number 14 involves creating a recursive um, definition. So you have to remember that the first term um, is equal to 10. So the first term basically involves f of 1, which represents the first term. So the first term is equal to 10. 
you want to look for the options where f of 1 is 10, that's 1 and 3. And then you look at the idea of common difference. Common difference simply means you constantly grow by 4. It's an additive relationship. You add 4 every time. If you add 4 every time, subsequent terms of your um, recursive function will differ from the previous by 4. So since the common difference is 4, you want to look for the function that has plus 4 in the definition of f of x. So if you look at option number 1, you can see that plus 4 there. That clearly indicates that you have a common difference. Multiplied by 4, as indicated in number 3, is a common ratio. Okay, so ratio is multiply, difference is adding. Okay, when you add a positive number, it's plus. When you add a negative number, it's minus. For number 15, um, we're looking at average rate of change and our um, ability to estimate the uh, value of the average rate of change depending on the steepness of a line. So you want to remember that the, as a line approaches a horizontal orientation, the slope is decreasing. So a line that's closer to the vertical and increasing from left to right is has a bigger slope or average rate of change than a more horizontal line. Okay, so since we're looking for the greatest average rate of change, the interval 4 and 5 are less steep than interval 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so when you're looking for average rate of change, you're just looking for the slope of the secant line connecting the two points on that interval. Okay, so 4 and 5 have less steep um, secant lines, so the average rate of change will be smaller. These three intervals is kind of difficult to accurately estimate what their slopes are, which is the average rate of change. So you actually have to compute the average rate of change for these three intervals. So if you compute them, um, the average rate of change, you can clearly see the one with the biggest um, slope will actually be the correct result. So in this problem, I just did um, intervals 1 and 2, which is from 0 to 1 hour, and 1 hour to 1.5 hours. I did not do interval 3 because you don't have 1.5 hours to 2.5 hours as an option. Okay? So we're just comparing um, intervals 1, 2, and then 4 and 5. So that's why I just did the first two, and then I got a bigger answer for interval one. So your correct answer is option number one, the interval from zero to one. For problem 16, you have to remember um, how to sketch your piecewise defined functions and family of functions. Absolute value functions are like these, and you have a radical function that looks like this, this orientation. Now, since the break happens at 1, you're going to be switching from your absolute value, your v function, to the radical function at x equals 1. And as you can see, option number 2 fits this description. For number 17, we're looking for the um, points where these two functions are equal to each other. Um, this is an easy calculator problem. What you simply do is enter the two functions in your calculator. And then you graph them, and um, you look for the point of intersection of the two functions, and that will basically um, help you figure out the result. Okay, so when you're when you're using your graphing calculator to find the intersection, you can don't forget that you can just use second function calculate to find the intersection points of the two graphs, and when you use your calculator to do that, you're looking for just the x value of your points of intersection. And um, as you can see, we have 4 and 1, negative 1.75 right here, which can be determined uh, using your calculator. Okay, so let me just show you how to do that real quick. So calculate intersection, 5, first curve, enter, second curve, enter, guess you move close to that point. So this is the second one. I know this is um, that. I don't know exactly what that is, but let's calculate this one first. Enter. 
and then you see negative 1.75 is the first um, x value of your point of intersection. And let me trace to the other one right there. And the other one is coming up. It's 4. Okay, so you can see that right there. Or you can use calculate. You can just look at that, and that is 4. So your answer is option number 2. For problem 18, you don't really have a shortcut per se. You just have to create a table and see when um, B exceeds A. So for A, you're growing by 5,000 each month, uh, starting with 10,000. So you keep adding 5,000 over and over again until you get to a point where the amount, the payment for B exceeds that of A. For B, um, you start with 500 and you double every month. Doubling basically means you multiply by 2. So you keep doing it, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and then at the 8th month, that was the first month that the payment for B exceeded that of A, so that's why the answer is option number 3. For problem 19, um, you just make use of your calculator to figure out the mean of A, the mean of B, and then your standard deviations, and then you compare the results that you get um, from your calculator. And then if you do that, you will see that the answer is option number one. For problem number 20, you just complete the square. One thing you want to remember um, when completing the square is that you have to add B over 2A, okay? So if you look at this form, Right here, that is the completed square of the vertex form of, of this polynomial function right here. So you follow these procedures, you find that term to complete the square, which is by computing b over 2 square. And do not forget, whatever you add in the parentheses, in order to leave the problem unchanged, you have to subtract that same value um, from the same side of the equation in order to get the correct um answer and then all we're just looking for here is just the a value and the a value is positive six for problem number 21 this is a pretty long problem there's a lot of things you have to know here just um, by looking at the table so for example the average rate of change over an interval you have to know your average rate of change formula and then you have to compute that to see um, if the average rate of change of g is greater than that of um, that of n of x. So for g, you basically have to plug in the values into the formula. But for n, the number is already given to you, so you just go directly to um, to the formula, the numerical representation. It takes much less work, and then you can just co compute the average rate of change um, there, and then. For number two, you're looking at the y-intercepts. You know um, to find the y-intercepts, you set x to zero. So this requires substituting zero for the x's. And in this case, you are looking for where x is equal to zero on your table. All right? And then for maximum value, if you look at the pattern of this function right here, what you notice is that it starts from negative 7, increases all the way to 9, and then decreases to negative 7. So you can see that the maximum should be occurring around 9. For g of x, more work is needed. You have to compute f of negative b over 2a in order to calculate what the maximum value is. If you do that, you get 9 as your answer. Okay, and then to find the roots um, for the table, you look for where y is equal to 0 or n of x is y, basically, so you have your two roots here. And then for g, to find the roots, you have to set it equal to zero, factor, and find the roots, and that will tell you what your roots are. In this problem, you're not just looking for the roots, you're looking for the sum of the roots. So you basically have to add the roots you get in both cases and compare them, all right? If you carry out all the procedures correctly, um, your final answer should be option number four, because the sum of roots of n of x will be greater than the sum of roots of g of x. For problem number 22, you have to remember that in order to get 
a rational result, you have to add rational numbers. So rational plus rational equals rational. And then you're given a bunch of options here. You have to look for the ones where the add-ins are actually rational. Okay? Um, so which ones can you simplify? How do you know if a radical is a rational number? If the radicand is a perfect square, like 4 and 9, then you have irrational term. Okay, so option 2 is rational because these two numbers can be simplified into 1 half and 1 third. And then since they're both rational, their sum must be rational also. For problem 23, you simply use the square root property to get x isolated. Do not forget, anytime you take the square root of a square, you have to introduce plus or minus um, into the equation. And then if you do that and get x isolated, you end up with option number 3 as your final result. And then for problem 24, the last one is just assessing your ability to simplify or expand polynomial expressions. So you want to remember that when you're squaring a quantity, you have to multiply the quantity by itself. You have, actually have to foil it out instead of just squaring the terms that are being added to each other. So x minus 2 squared is not x squared minus 4. It's x minus 2 times x minus 2. Okay, so you can use the box method. This is a very, very good method that students make very little mistakes with. When multiplying polynomials, you can use that, or you can just simply foil out to get your answer. Combine like terms, you end up with option number four as your final answer. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. If you found the contents of this real quick review beneficial to you, do give us a thumbs up. If you have any questions or need support on any of these um, questions, just post a comment in the comment section below and we'll be glad to support you. Do not forget to subscribe for other great tutorials to help you do well in the Algebra Regents exam and also in your math courses in general. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.